press the button once and nothing happened, I hope you can get it to work. Yeah, it looks like it is. All right. We will go from current slide. And this is where we'll start example two. But I uh, did want to, and this is not very important at all, it was in my box this morning. It's Dick Coffey, whoever he is, football guy for 2019, and it has a couple of uh, Alabama player and coach and an uh, Auburn player and coach on the uh, cover. No UAB mentioned here, but lots of other things, Tim, here. And you're certainly welcome to look at it. Major college schedules are all here. Southeastern Conference, Alabama High School. I mean, there's tons of stuff. And uh, it may be put out by the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. Seems like it usually is. And that's Sheriff Petway on the back, so maybe that's who distributes it. But anyway, it's here. If anyone's interested in it, it's here. You may have it. You may refer to it. You can use it, leave it, take it, whatever. It'll be up here on the front until someone does take it. So knock yourself out. That's the only major announcement I know about, and that's not very major. Uh, any questions on anything we've done up to now? Okay. Well, we were in Chapter 7, Applications of Integration. 7.3 is volume, and we're doing now the shell method. We've done the disk method, and I can't get my... There we go. And example 2 is also using the shell method. Find the volume of the solid form by revolving the region bounded by the graph of x is equal to e to the minus y squared about the y-axis, I'm sorry, that's not the right symbol, okay, find the value of this, about the y-axis between 0 less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 1. Okay? No, I'm sorry. Misread it. Find the volume of the solid form by revolving the region bounded by this graph and the y-axis. Sorry, all that mess on that, and I was writing the wrong word. And the y-axis. about the x-axis. Okay. Now, uh, I'm not going to plot points for this. I'm going to... It seems like we did this one. No, we did do it last time, didn't we? I have two marks on the page. I didn't erase one up. Sorry about that. So we've already done that. I said this looks awfully familiar. This is where we pick up today. Comparison of the disk and shell methods. Okay. Any questions on anything we've done so far? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Now, the disk and shell methods can be distinguished as follows. For the disk method, the representative rectangle is always perpendicular to the axis of revolution. If it's going around like this, for the disk method, the representative rectangle is perpendicular to the axis of revolution. That's what makes the disk, okay? Or the washer, if that's the case. Whereas for the shell method, the representative rectangle is always parallel to the axis of revolution, making the shell, okay? Um, so, when you're revolving, if this is your uh, curve here, uh, 
They don't give it a name here, I would assume. This is your curve. They don't give a name for it, but if that's your curve, and this is your uh, dy that you have, and you're revolving it around the y-axis, this would then be basically the washer method. It's a disk method, but with a hole in the center, because you're going around the y-axis. Okay? So you see the rectangle is uh, perpendicular to the axis of revolution. Then, it's, the volume is pi because you're doing an area of a outer circle and an inner circle. Subtracting from this, that. Okay? So pi capital R squared, that would be the function value as a function of y. So you have to express this function as a function of y, not of x. Okay? To do the the disk method or the washer method, minus this one. Well, that R, uh, it doesn't indicate where you're going to, but this is some fixed value X here, okay? Uh, and whatever that length is, that's what you're, you're subtracting that square. And here's Fred. Top part of the alphabet doing quite nicely here. Bottom part kind of missing completely with one in the middle. Okay. Now, if you were doing the same, no, this is different. This time we're doing the, a curve. Doesn't really look like the same curve, but some curve like that curve uh, here, and you're revolving around the x-axis, but you have a vertical, and here's the y-axis. You're revolving around the x-axis, again, you're making a washer. A disk from this minus a disk from this, and you'd be doing the same thing. The difference here is you have dx here, so this function, which is your outer radius, would need to be expressed as a function of x, not of y. Okay? This had to be a function of y. And then this value here, this little r here, whatever it is, you know, you're, you must be given that in the problem, you subtract that disk uh, away from the outer disk. So again, it's pi, the outer disk squared minus inner disk, inner radius squared, uh, dx. This was a dy, so this meant this radius had to be a function of y, this one a function of x. Okay. For the shell method, however, uh, if you had the problem similar to this one, okay, now, similar to this one, it looks like, okay, but you're revolving this around the y axis, since your disk, your uh, rectangle here, is parallel to the axis of revolution, that's going to form a shell when you revolve that around it. So the radius of that shell, is the circumference of the shell, is 2 pi r, where r is the radius here, they call it p here, 2 pi p times the height of that times the thickness of that, and that gives you your uh, shell the volume of the shell going around, integrate this from A to B, you've got it not. So you see, you don't have subtractions involved like you do here for the washer method. Just, this is a pi here, this is two pi, oh, this is pi r squared, this is two pi r, then multiplied by the height and the thickness. Okay. Going around the uh, x-axis, if your rectangle is parallel to the axis of revolution, that's going to give you a shell method, so now your uh, 2 pi integral from C to D, your dy is what you're doing here, uh, because that's the thickness of the shell. Uh, your radius here is a function of y, in fact that is y, okay? Uh, the height, that you would need to get as a function of y. So you would need to know this, uh, the 
value of this curve as a function of y minus this x value here, whatever that is, that makes a difference to you in the problem. So there's your child there. Okay. Rectangle is perpendicular to the axis of revolution. It's the shell to the disc of the washer method. It's parallel. It's the shell method. Okay. Here's example three on the following page. And this one you can go to larsoncalculus.com for an interactive version of this type of example. If this, what we're saying here, doesn't make sense, and uh, the solution shown here doesn't make sense, go and you can interact with the heat presentation. Okay. Find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graphs of y is equal to x squared plus 1, y is equal to 0, x equals 0 and x equals 1 about the y-axis. Okay? So, let's do some type of a drawing here. Okay? You're going around the, the y-axis, so you don't need much on x here. So I'm just going to put the x-axis down here, because x equals 0 is the bottom. Uh, we'll put... Uh, x equal 1 up here. I'm going to put it here because I have a feeling I know where this is going. Uh, we'll put 1 down here and here and 2 over here and here. I think I've gone too big. No, I haven't. I'm fine. I don't need the 2's out there. Okay. But I do need to appear, okay? Because when x is equal to 0, your y is 1. Okay. When x equal 1, your y is 2. When x equal minus 1, your y is 2. Right? So this is a parabola like that. Agreed or not? Okay? A parabola vertical shift of 1. Okay? x equals 0 is this line here. y is equal to 0 is this line here. And x equals 1 is this line here. Okay? So you're revolving this around the y-axis, so it goes over here to this value and revolves this way. Now, since everything's given in x, that's the first, my first approximation of my rectangle, okay? That makes this a dx because we know this line here is y is equal to x squared plus 1. And looks like to me this is set up perfectly as what kind of a uh, method do we do? Don't read the title. Shell method, okay? Because the rectangle is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. I mean parallel to the axis of rotation. Okay, what do we need to know? What's going to be our formula for the volume? 2 pi, because that's going to be a circumference. This rectangle is ro revolving around over here, this axis, and the amount of revolution is going to be 2 pi r, and the r is simply the x value of that rectangle, right? So that's going to be 2 pi integral x. That's how it's going to start. That's the 2 pi or the circumference of the travel of that rectangle times the height of the rectangle. Well, that's just this minus 0. So that's x squared plus 1. That's the height of the rectangle, the y value, times the thickness of the rectangle, and that's our 
dx. And where is, since x is your or your variable of integration, okay? Josh is here. Is the likely story right there. Josh is here. Dawson's still trying to get the water out of his ears, huh? Okay. Yeah, What's that? Dawson got caught at the light. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Any, uh, what are my limits since we're zero to one because the X is going from zero to one? What would be the first thing you would do to solve that integral? Okay, distribute. Okay, distribute X across the parentheses and what do you get? What do you get? X cubed plus X dx. Now, the easy part is the calculus. 2 pi times, what's the antiderivative of X cubed? X to the fourth over 4 plus X squared over 2. Evaluated from 0 to 1. I love 0 to 1. Those are so usually pretty easy to do. What would this be? 2 pi times, pretty easy to do, 1 fourth plus 1 half minus the 0 part. I'll do that part. Done. And what does this give you? <coughs> 2 pi times 3 fourths. What does that give you? 3 pi over 2. 3 halves pi, however you want to say it. <coughs> yep, that's what they got. 3 pi over 2. Okay. Now, We'll watch them do it. Well, uh, we'll come back to it. Okay. Let's let me clear my scratch out of the way. Any questions on my scratch? Say how we did it, why we did it. Any questions? All right, Therese. Yay. All right. The washer method. What? Oh, requires two integrals to determine the volume of the solid. It actually is a washer and a disk method. If you had done the that method, this the washer method, this part would have been a disk, this part would have been a washer. Okay? So it requires two integrals. It also requires you to get the function because the row axis of row is this way, you have to have your rectangles perpendicular to do the disk or washer method. That means you have to have a dy. That means you have to get the function back as a function of y. So that means you change your this function to y minus 1 and then the square root of that, but we don't need plus or minus because we're only going to take the positive square root, and that becomes your r for the little r for the washer method. The capital R is your 1 out here, okay, because you're, that's the outer radius minus this radius. Of course, when you square this, this is going to be a lot easier to deal with, and it's okay. Here, it's just the washer method with the radius of 1. In fact, you could do that just as a shape you already know, that's a tin can of radius 1, height 1, so it's pi r squared a, so you could do that. Uh, you don't have to do the integration, you would know what that is. This is not the easy way to do it. They call it this method here, the washer method there, 
Either way, it's not the easier way to do it because you have two integrations to do. Okay. And the guy wouldn't run the red light. Good. All right. Dawson's here. All right. Top part of the alphabet doing quite well now. We're just missing DR and Devon, the second other Devon. Okay. Hopefully they will be getting here too. Okay, but you can work it this way. And when you work it that way, the washer method here, pi, what you're doing is area of the outer circle, pi, pi times 1 squared, uh, minus pi times 0 squared. So this is just pi, pi. Okay, that's, that's all there is. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, because this will be 1, uh, square that will be 1, and it will be y, and you integrate it, and then pi, pi y evaluated from 0 to 1 is just pi. Okay, so take care of that in a minute. The second part, the washer part, you're doing from 1 to 2, that's what your dy's are going from, this y was going from 0 to 1. This is going 1 to 2, and then the outer shell is still the 1 squared. The inner is the y, square root of y minus 1, but when you square that, this becomes y minus 1. So, these integrals just become 1 for this one, and this becomes a 1 here, minus, and when you square this, it's minus y minus 1. But the minus change, you know, keeps that to be a minus y. This becomes a plus 1. So that 1 plus 1 is 2, high level math today. And this is what you're integrating from 1 to 2. This integrates just to be pi. This integrates to be uh, 2y minus y squared over 1. Long way to do the problem. Uh, but this is going from 1 to 2. And when you plug the values in, I have a feeling they're not going to show. Yeah, they do. Okay. This will just be a pi. This will be a 4. When you plug in a 2, pi's out front. This will be 4 minus 4 over 2, which is minus 2. Then when you plug the 1 in, that will be another minus 2. Then minus a minus makes a plus 1 over 2. Okay. Well, 4 minus 4 is 0. So this is one half pi. Pi plus one half pi is three half pi, which is exactly what we got the other way. Three pi over two. Now, why do it that way? I don't know. Just to show you, it's harder to do it that way than if you do it the shell method. Uh, it only requires one integral because now you're doing your rectangle parallel to the axis of revolution, that gives you the shell method. The one uh, integration will be 2 pi times this radius, which is x. Well, something ahead. Here is the function. The height of the function is your x squared plus 1. The radius, there it is. The radius of revolution is your x. That's how far you are from the y-axis. That's x. And you're integrating from 0 to 1. x is the 0 to x. One because you've got the x. So that's going to be a pretty simple one to do. This is the one we did. The integral will be 2 pi times the radius. That gives you circumference of that rectangle, what it goes around the circle. 2 pi x, this will be, times your height, which is <coughs> x squared plus 1, times your dx. Uh, circumference times height times thickness. There's your volume element. Okay, so 2 pi x, x squared plus 1 dx. Pretty simple integration. First multiplied, well, they don't even show how they did it. Jump right to the answer, which is exactly what we got. x fourth over 4 plus x squared over 2, evaluated from 0 to 1. And that gives you 2 pi times 3 fourths, which is 3 halves pi exactly what we got before. Any questions?
Whoa. And that's the last slide of the presentation here, example three. We've got example four, example five yet to go. So let's back up. Any questions before I delete these? Not delete them completely. But get rid of them so I can write examples four and five. Okay. Example four is the volume of a pontoon. Okay. If you are not a boater, you may not know what a pontoon is, but it's a device that usually is filled with air that you hold up whatever structure you've got, usually a boat. Pontoon can be made in the shape shown in this figure. The pontoon is designed by rotating the graph of y is equal to 1 minus x squared over 16 when the x is going from negative 4 less than or equal to x less than or equal to positive 4. Okay? Rotating that about the x-axis. Okay? Where x and y are measured in feet. Find the volume of the pontoon. Okay? Now, it's probably going to require a little bit of graphing here. So let's set it up. The y is going from 0 to 1. The x is going from the 1, 2, 3, 4. There's your minus 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. And there's your plus 4. Okay? When x is 0, y is 1. When x is 1, y is uh, 15 sixteenths, right? Not very far down from there. When x is 2, that's 1 minus uh, 1 fourth, so that would be 3 quarters, somewhere about like there. When x is 3, uh, that would be 1 minus 9 sixteenths. That would be uh, sixteen minus nine, seven sixteenths, just under half. And then when x is equal to zero, uh, four, you're at zero. You do the same thing over here, and basically I don't have my thing, and you rotate that around the x-axis. Okay. And it forms sort of a pontoon like whoops, something like that. Okay. Now, which way would you suggest that we try to uh, solve this? You like dx's or dy's? That's usually where I start first. You like dy's. You like dx's. Is that what I hear? Okay. Uh, a little bit of battle of the the variables here. Uh, frankly, just looking at it, since y is already a function of x, I'd be inclined to go with the dx. Okay. And let's see what happens with that. Now, yeah. If you did a dx here. What kind of method would you be using? Washer or disk? Now, if you did the dy, look at what you're doing. You're, those are your rectangles. Uh, that's supposed to be a rectangle. It doesn't much look like one. You're going from one side to another. That means you have to get this in terms of y. And you can. It's doable. But it's going to be a bit messy. So I think I... If I can, I'm going to go with the uh, dx's because you've already got the y, fun y as a function of x here, and that's what you're measuring here, and this is your dx. 
So what is your, which method are you using then? Disk or washer, uh, or shell? That's disk method because the, uh, the rectangle is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Okay? So what's your formula then? Anybody? Okay. Going to be pi times some integral. Integral will be going from what to what? Okay. Y'all are hard workers. I like to see that. That's really good to have. You're just not quite lazy enough, though. Okay? Why? So, yeah, yeah, let's just double it, zero to four. Because this is the same, even though my drawing doesn't look like it, exactly the same pontoon on this side, half the pontoon on this side. So let's just double it. So go two and then go zero to four. Go make the evaluation a lot, a lot easier. Uh, now, I never, uh, just a dumb question here. Never did quite figure out what class y'all are taking. I know it's in the pool. Are y'all doing water aerobics or doing uh, swimming? Oh, swimming. Okay, I thought we had, what is that, uh, Olympic? That too, What's that? I mean, we, I know that class is available, water aerobics. Yeah, and is that the one that you practice for the synchronized swimming? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm just kidding, because one of my favorite, and this goes way back, y'all would never have seen it, Saturday Night Live things with Martin Short and somebody else doing synchronized swimming. It was around an Olympics time. If you can ever see a clip of that, it is unbelievably funny. I mean, Martin Short is there with nose plugs, uh, a life preserver, uh, you know, the whole thing, and he stands in the shallow end and does all the water aerobics. And I thought, never mind. All right. We're going zero to four. What else? We got the inside of this to do. What do we do? Now, the two pi isn't because of a circumference. Uh, yeah, this is twice because we're doing double. Okay, we're just doing half of it here, so that's why we have twice. Pi times what? Yeah, our r squared. And what is our radius here? It's the y, exactly. 1 minus x squared over 16 times our dx. Yeah, squared times our dx. Now, that's what makes it a little messy, okay? This, you got to square a pretty ugly-looking uh, uh, expression here. But that's doable. In fact, I think probably what I would want to do then before I go to square it. Well, no, I think it squares okay this way. So let's do that. V is equal to 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 4. How do you square that? What would that yield? You want to remember how to square a binomial? You can either write it out and foil it, or use the rule. Foil it. All right. Okay. 1 minus x squared over 16 times 1 minus x squared over 16. Goodness gracious, how did the x get down there? Okay. Kind of nuts here. All right. So let's foil that one. What do you get? 1. Second. That doubled. Why didn't we do that in the first place? Okay, yeah. What is that doubled? Minus uh, x squared over 8. Perfect. Last. This is the messy part. Is what? X to the 4th. X to the 4th over... 256, having to remember what the square of 16 is. Okay? If you don't remember, you can do that on the calculator. Okay? 
So this is what we're going to put inside our integrand here. 1 minus x squared over 8 plus x fourth over 256 dx. All right, when you integrate that, what do you get? 2 pi times, say again, x, that's the easy part, minus x cubed over 24, these are getting to be some big denominators, plus fifth over, goodness gracious, what's that one? One thousand what? Two hundred and eight. Is that what you said? Eighty. Okay, I thought that sounded better. Okay, one thousand two hundred eighty. Evaluated from zero to four. How, don't you wish we'd have gone from minus four to four? No. Okay. This will be two pi times four is easy, at least for that first one. Minus. Okay. 4 cubed over 24. Well, I know 4 will go into 24 six times, so let's get rid of those two, and that leaves us a 4 squared over 6. So that would be 16 six. Everybody follow what I just did? It was magic. See what I did? I knew this was going to be 4 cubed, that's 4 times 4 times 4, this is 4 times 6, right? So one of the 4's goes away, 4 times 4 would be 16 over 6, which I could have reduced one more time, but I didn't. Okay, plus, is this going to be any better? Okay, 16 is 4 squared. And since we squared it, that's 4 to the 4th, okay? Um, so, see, I'm real tempted. Let's back up a step. This will just make life so much easier, okay? Let's back up a step, okay? The first would be... 3 times four squared, right? No, it's eight. Say again? It's eight. Oh, yeah, four. I'm sorry. Okay, what you say was eight? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, two times four. I'm sorry, not four squared. Okay. 2 times 4. Yeah, okay. 16. Yeah, it was 8. You're right. I'm looking at the wrong one. Uh, 2 times 4. 8, okay. And this one was, that's the one that is um, 5 from our integration, and it was 16 squared, which is 4 to the 4th. Right? Finally got my act together here. Okay. Well, this is going to be a 4 cubed up here. And 1 4 will go out with that one. And then another 4. This will leave you 4 times 4 over 2. It would be 16 over 2. It would be 8. So it's 8 thirds. Right? Okay. This one is going to be 4 to the 5th over 4 to the 4th, so that's just going to be 4, so it's 4 fifths. Makes the math a little easier. Not much, but a little bit. Okay, I'll do the zero part, since we didn't go the minus 4. If we had gone minus 4, you'd do it again. Okay. So now we've got to, here's the hard part common denominators. What is your least common denominator? 15. So this will be how many fifteenths is 4? C. 
60 fifteenths. Isn't that four? I'll pull out the calculator and see. Okay, yeah. Okay, how many fifteenths is eight thirds? Forty thirds plus, and how many fifteenths is four fifths? Forty fifteenths, I'm sorry. You're right. And how many fifteenths is four fifths? Twelve fifteenths. Okay. Now, adding those together, 60 minus 40 is 20, plus 12 is 32. So you have 32 times 2 pi all over 15. And there's nothing that's going to cancel out of that, so it's 64 pi 15. How did I get a 16th out of that? I don't know. Okay. I know I'm doing some wing dangle math here, but it's just easier than writing all that mess out. Is that what we get? 64 pi 15s. Perfect. They actually plug in. And here's a real easy way to approximate your answer. Pi is just a little more than 3, right? And 3 will go to the 15 pi time. Okay? So you got something... Uh, 64 divided by 5, that's going to be something uh, just a little over 12, I thought. Yeah, so that's 13.4 cubic centimeters. So that makes sense. That's a reasonable answer. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Example 5 is at the bottom of the page, page 469. Any questions for our race? Hopefully my algebra is not confusing, or actually just math is not confusing anyone besides me. Okay. Now let's do example 5. Find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graphs of y is equal to x cubed plus x plus 1. y is equal to 1. x equal 1. About the line y is x equal to. Okay. Now, they've shown us a figure, but let's go on and draw the best we can. Uh, your x-axis is down here. Everything else is well above it. Uh, when x equals 0, this is equal to 1. Probably should not have drawn the y-axis there. Let me... Because whatever we've got there is going around x equal 2, so let's put the y-axis here, okay? Hopefully, okay. Let's do something like 1, 2, 3, 4. That's going to cover just about everything we need there, and here's 1. I don't think we'll need anything much above that. Okay. When x equals 0, y is equal to 1. We're right there. Okay. When x is equal to 1, y is equal to 3. Uh, I should have drawn one more. Okay. x equal 1, y is equal to 3. Okay. Now, we could do some intermediate things, but I'll take a glance at the book and just show it's a curve going like that. Not a parabola, by the way. This is not parabolic, so don't get that confused. x equal 1, that's going to be that. y is equal to 1, that's going to be that. So the curve that's in here, right? That's the only part we're 
revolving around the x equal 2. So this is going around to here. Okay. That's basically, it's going to be something that goes around like that. Okay. Around the axis x equal 2. All right. I don't know what you call this, a really big fat Christmas tree stand. I mean, it's less stand than you have Kurt tree. I don't think it'll work very well, but you, know, you get the general idea. Okay. I think I've set the problem up right. It looks like it is. Do you think we can wash her this one? To wash her this, we would have to have your horizontal bar here because the axis is vertical. So we have to have a horizontal bar. So then you would need dy's. And to get the dy, you have to get this as a function of y. Anyone want to tackle that? Not me. Okay? That is going to be close to, if not totally impossible. Okay? So what are we going to need to do? Have our little representative recta rectangle parallel to the axis of revolution, which means we're coming around like this, and it comes in over here somewhere. Okay. So what method is that? Shell method. And how does that go? What is the volume of the shell method? 2 pi. 2 pi. Okay, now <laughs> some issues begin. Okay, first, notice we have dx's here. So I'm going to put the dx out here, and my x's are going from 0 to 1. Right? x equals 0, x equals 1. So let's get those in. But now we've got to figure out what your radius is. You're going around this axis here, and you're going out to here or here, probably back to here. Okay? So what is your radius? This is what they've been calling your P. And what is your P here? It's just from here to there. This is x equal 2 here, remember? So the radius is 2 minus whatever the x value is here. Well, the x value here is x, right? As x goes from 0 to 1, so the radius will be 2 minus x. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And that radius is... 2 pi times that radius, 2 minus x. Now we've got the height of that, and the height of that is what? The height of this rectangle here. What's the upper bar? Upper point? That's your y value there. That would be x cubed plus x plus 1, right? But then you're subtracting off 1, because this is that y is equal to 1. So subtract off 1, so it's just x cubed minus, I mean, plus x. Do you see that? Oh, I don't need that. thought I'd already drawn something in there. There's your 2 pi 2 pi r h d times the thickness. The height of that is just from that thing down to 1. Subtract 1 from it, you just get x cubed minus x. x cubed plus x. For some reason, I keep wanting to put a minus in there. What you got to do first? Anybody? Yeah, let's fall it. Okay, so V is equal to 2 pi 
times the integral from 0 to 1. That's your x, okay? Now, what's the... When you fall this, what you get? 2x cubed. Outer is going to be... Say again, plus 2x. Inner is going to be... Inner is going to be... What is it? Minus x to the fourth, and your last is going to be minus x squared. And then you've got your dx. Now that's not a nice decreasing, uh, whatever you call it, exponent form, but it's okay. It's just a polynomial. You can have it out of order. Uh, not in a courtroom, maybe, but everywhere else you're okay. So let's do the math then. This is the calculus part. This is the easy part. 2 pi times what? Antiderivative of 2x cubed. Okay, 2x to the 4th over 4, so that would be x to the 4th over 2. Okay, plus... That is x to the fourth. That's a really ugly four, isn't it? Okay. Now it's an ugly one. Okay. X squared minus x to the fifth over five minus x cubed over three. Evaluated from 0 to 1. Thank you, 0 to 1. If that was something else, I'd be miserable, okay? 0 to 1 is not too bad. So the volume is equal to 2 pi times what? Anybody? Not that hard. Second? Yeah, Where's the square root? I know they're supposed to be on the square root. Yeah. Um, x to the 4 divided by 2 plus x squared. Okay. All right. Are you redoing the, the integration here? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So this would be, as someone said, 2x to the 4th over 4. It's 2 simple. over 4 is 1 over 2. X to the fourth. Right? Right. Okay. And this one would have been a 2x squared over 2. This is just. Oh, a square. Yeah, That's what you're saying. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said a square root. Okay, got it. Um, also, I have another question. Okay. Um, how do we look at that? Okay. Okay, this one right here. Okay, we fold this. Yeah, the 2 minus x was here. That's our radius. Right. You know where we got that? It's going from x equals 2 to x equals x. Okay, so that's 2 minus x. Then the height of this was this thing, the y, x cubed plus x minus 1. I mean plus 1, minus 1, because you're going from here. So the 1 minus 1 goes away, so you're left with that. Okay. All right, and then you fold Okay, we're doing the integral of this thing here, swung around here. The oh, circumference is going to take care of this part here. We're just doing the area of this taken around this. The 2 pi r is taking care of that part, then the height is this and the dx is that. So we're just doing the area of this rectangle times the thickness of the width of this rectangle times the distance it travels around here. That's 2 pi times this radius here. Uh, this radius here. That's 2 minus x. Yeah. Okay. 
good questions. Okay. Now, what is x fourth over 2 evaluated at 1? 1 half plus 1. Now, because it was 1 there, whether it was a square or not, I would have gotten the right answer, though I had the wrong problem. Okay. Go on. Minus 1 fifth. Minus one third, and I'll do the zero part. Okay, done. All right. Now we got <laughs> the hard part of the problem is the fractions. Okay, of course. Okay, it's v is equal to two pi, and this time we're going to have least common denominator of what? Thirty. How many half? How many thirtieths is one half? 15 thirtieths. How many thirtieths is 1? 30 thirtieths. Minus how many thirtieths is 1 fifth? 6 thirtieths. And how many thirtieths is 1 third? 10 thirtieths. Okay. So let's do the easiest way we can do this math. 30 minus 10 is 20 plus 15 is 35, minus 6 is 29 thirtieths? Is that right? So 2 pi times 29 thirtieths, I think. The 2 will go into the 30 15 times. This will be 29 pi over 15. 29 15 is pi. Nice round number. Oh, look at that. 29 pi over 15. Excellent. See how it works? You want to do that sh uh, disk method, anybody? Okay, please say no. Washer method, no. No, no, no. Shell method, absolutely necessary on that. That finishes 7.3. Okay? I think I've told you before, I would do either 3 or 5, they're both at count chat, then any of the odds 7 through 11, they're at count chat, but 7's at count view. Do either 13 or 15, they're at count chat, and any of the odds 17 to 21, they're at count chat, and 17's at count view. Do either 23 or 25, both at count chat, 23's at count view. Do 27, it's both at count chat and count view. 29 or 31, they're both at count chat. 33 or 35, they're both at count chat. You can explore doing 37 and or 39 if you would like. That's up to you. Uh, 41 is at count chat, and both of those others should be at count chat as well. Either 43 or 45, they should both be at count chat. Uh, 47 or 49. Oh, I'm sorry, let's do any of the odds 47 through goodness gracious they keep on going don't they let's say 61 okay any of the odds 47 through 61 they should all be at count chat okay a right, nice looking little section project on Saturn you don't need to do that, but if you are really interested in it, it sounds like sort of a fun thing to do. All right, finish with that. Any questions on 7.3? So let's move on to All right. 7.4 So we've done I already forgotten what 7 1 was doing. I'd go back and look, but then we did volumes. 7 1 was what? Uh, area between two curves. Yeah, just area between two curves. Uh, then 7 2 was volume by disk or washer method. 7 3, uh, volume by shell method. Now we get into another application of integration, and this is arc length. 
and surfaces of revolution. Okay. And we'll go from the current slide. So, still in Chapter 7, Applications of Integration, this application will be arc length, and then we'll extend that to be surfaces of revolution. Okay. We'll first find the arc length of a smooth curve. Can anyone tell me what a smooth curve, what differentiates a smooth curve from one that's not smooth? No kinks in it, is that what you said? Yeah, no edges, points, corners, things like that has to be smooth. What's another word you can use that almost defines what smooth is? Continuity. Okay. Continuity. Con continuity. That certainly will constitute part of a smooth curve. The other thing, differentiable. Because at those points and things, not differentiable. So, to be smooth, you can almost guarantee it has to be differentiable. Okay. Don't want to quite say that because somebody will come up with one little counterexample or more. And then once we find arc length of a smooth curve, we'll take that smooth curve and revolve it around something to make a surface for revolution. So, that will be the second part. So, let's start with arc length. <coughs> Definite integrals are used to find arc lengths of curves and the areas of surface of, of uh, surface of revolution. Yeah, that's why we put them in the techniques finding uh, application part. In either case, an arc, which is some segment of a curve, is approximated by okay. Our easiest way to do length is our distance formula. So those are always linear lengths, okay? So what we're going to do is approximate an arc by a straight line segment who's going to be close to that but not quite. Now that straight line segment will be the distance from point 0.1 to point 0.2. Point 0.1 is x1, y1, and point 0.2 is x2, y2. And the distance from between those two is good old distance formula x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. That gives you d squared, right? Pythagorean theorem, okay? And then take the square root of that and you've got d. That's going to be the straight line distance, the shortest distance between those two points. Now, if that's actually an arc there, the arc is going to be a little longer. But as long as your dx, dy thing is Small enough, it's going to be close. Okay. Now this is a rectifiable curve. It is one that has a an arc, a finite arc length. Okay. So you can't be a curve that's going to infinity up there. That's where your continuity comes into play. There is no end point. You can't know if it's going to infinity. So um, it has a finite arc length. And as long as it's rectifiable, that sounds like to me rectangle. In other words, you can basically approximate the length of that curve with a linear approximation. Okay? I'm not sure that's what it means, but that's what I interpret that to be. How I remember, if I ever remember the word. You'll see that a sufficient condition for a curve for a graph of a function f to be rectifiable between a f of a, that's x1, y1, and b f of b, x2, y2, is that f prime be continuous on a to b. Not f, yeah, it needs, needs to be continuous, but f prime needs to be continuous. So that means it's differential. Okay? f prime must be continuous on that function, on that interval. Such a function is continuously differentiable on A to B, and its graph on A to B will then be a smooth curve. So not only does it have to be differentiable, but the derivatives have to be continuous. Okay. So let's consider a function, y is equal to f of x, is continuously differentiable on the interval A to B. 
Oh, here will be A here, B there. Here's the tip. Ah, that looks smooth, and its derivative is con is different, continuously different. You can approximate the graph of F, this graph here, from here to there, by a line segment here, a line segment here, a line segment. They only show yeah, by a series of line segments like this one. Okay, it underestimates, but it's still not a bad guess. Okay, uh, a graph of n line segments whose endpoints are determined by x of uh, with a equal x of zero, uh, then an x of one, that line segment, x of two, that line segment, so on up as many x as you want to put in there until you get to x of n, which is your last one b. Okay, uh, this is the actual length. Symbol for arc length is produced by always s. Back in trick, remember we had s to be the arc length. So s is the length of the curve or the arc length from a to b. These line segments you would draw here will underestimate that length, but still be pretty close. Okay, most of the time. By letting your delta x of i be x of i minus x of i minus 1, your delta y would be delta twice of i minus i sub 1 y sub i minus 1, you can approximate the length of the graph as the summation of all your 1s to n, however many intervals you have there. Okay? You've broken this into n equal intervals, as many of those as you have, you have the square root of x of i minus x of i minus 1 squared. That would be that first little one. Uh, that's your x part. The y part would be that part. y sub i minus y minus sub i minus 1 squared. That would be that. And the square root of that would be your little, kind of like the delta s squared, but not quite. Okay? because it's, uh, that's a linear approximation. But sum all those up, let your n go to infinity. Now it doesn't matter. As, run, as those get smaller, 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 your linear approximation is now approaching the curve, arc approximation uh, value. Now here's the tricky part. Okay, this is your delta x of i squared. There's your delta y sub i squared. These are exactly as defined. Here's what you do. Divide this by delta y sub i squared, this by delta y sub i squared, but then multiply the outside by the square root, and this is uh, dividing by that is also, because that's under the radical, delta y sub i squared, the square root of that is delta y. And yeah, take it sure maps the sub e to the cafe. I'm sorry, I did it backwards. Divide by delta x of i squared. So that gives you a one here. This is delta y sub i divided by delta x of i, and then multiplied by delta x, which is the square root of delta x of i squared. It goes on the outside. And what do you have here now? The summation from i equal one to n of the square root of 1 plus, what is delta y sub i over delta x sub i? dy cubed x. Your derivative. Your derivative squared. And then multiply that by delta x on the outside of the radical. And let's do a Riemann sum type thing here, let n go to infinity. This is getting smaller and smaller. This becomes a dy dx. That becomes a dx. And you have this approximation appears to become better and better and better as your norm, which is the magnitude of the largest of these intervals here, is approaching zero. Your n's going to infinity. That gives you a the limit as that norm goes to zero of this thing here, then uh, you've already said this thing has to exist. That's what this thing is. This is your L prime. Okay?
Okay. Uh, then this thing here becomes f prime at c sub i, where c is some center value of that. But as the value is getting closer and closer to zero, it doesn't matter where the center is, just call it at x. Okay. And that's what you're aiming toward. And then this interval here, this sum here, goes to this integral here. The limit is this goes to your s is the integral from a to b, that's your first endpoint to the last endpoint, the square root of 1 minus f, sub f, f prime of x squared dx. s is called the arc length of l between a and b. The length of that arc. Now, doesn't that look like a fun integral to try to solve? And if you think about it, you have to come up with functions that when you take their derivatives, square that derivative, add one to that derivative, and then take the square root of that, you come up with something you can integrate. That's going to take some pretty creative guessing. <laughs> or, in fact, we're going to count on them giving us ones we can do. Otherwise, numerical integration is going to be about the only answer here. Don't mean to sound negative about it, but that really is what you get. In order to come up with an f that does that, these are some going to be some weird little functions f. So expect to see some weird functions f. So here's the definition of an arc length. Let's let the function y be some f of x represent a smooth curve on the interval a to b. The arc length of f between a and b then would be, because it's a smooth curve, it is differentiable. So the arc length is the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus the derivative of that function squared, okay, dx. Pretty simple looking formula, but then if you start trying to imagine what functions f you can put in there that you can deal with. Yeah, okay. Similarly for a smooth curve, x is a function of y, g of y. Uh, the arc length of g between c and d, these would be on the y-axis, because that's what you're doing, uh, would be the integral from y is equal to c to y is equal to d of the square root of 1 plus g prime of y squared dy. Again, yeah just as squirrely a looking function as you can imagine. All right, so let's do an easy one first. Incredibly easy. Find the arc length from x1, y1 to x2, y2 on the graph of y is, uh, f of x is equal to mx plus b. Okay. Hopefully you're not going to have to think too hard about this one, but let's do it. According to their little formula, here. What is the first thing you're going to have to do? Well, one of the first things. Okay, if you go back, you got to take the derivative of the f, right? So what's your derivative of f here? f prime of x is equal to anybody? One of the easier questions I've asked all day. Don't let its ease fool you into thinking that can't be right. It probably is. Is what? Say again? You probably got it. No, that's the variable. If f is equal to mx plus b, what's the derivative of f? If this were 3x plus 2, I'd say what's its derivative? Say again? Oh, you said m, going back to this? Yeah, that's the derivative of m. It would be 3 right here, right? Derivative of 3x plus 2 would just be 3, right? All right. Okay. 
All right. That's the first thing you need to know. Okay. What's the next thing you're going to need? You got F prime now. You're going to need to square it. So what's your F prime of X squared? M squared. All right. Okay. What's the next thing you're going to need to do? Add 1 to it. Okay. So 1 plus F prime of X squared is equal to, not that hard, yes, m squared plus 1. Or you could have gotten away with 1 plus m squared. Either way, it doesn't matter. Okay? Then what's the next thing you're going to do with it? Take the square root of it. So the square root of this thing will be the square root of that thing. So that would be basically what's inside your radical, right? Now, all right, so the arc length is the integral from A to B, where A is your minimum X to B is your maximum X. So in this case, that's X1 to X2. So the arc length S will equal to the integral from x1 to x2 of the very thing we have here, the square root of m squared plus 1 dx. All right. <clears throat> now, I'm sorry, I probably jilted you a little bit. What is your M between these two points? What's that? And how do you get it? Okay, that's a 2, not a squared. I don't know where that came from. Okay, Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Okay, so that's what they're writing down here. Integral from x1 to x2 of the square root of <clears throat> y2. I did it again, okay? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 squared plus 1. Dx. Okay? Now, this is almost much ado about nothing, but you know, I'm trying to do what the book says. Okay. x2, 1 minus uh, to x2 of uh, square root of y2 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus x1 squared. What I'm doing is multiplying both sides of this by x2 minus x1 squared. Uh, enough to drive you nuts almost, okay? And the, this is all a constant, by the way, folks. It's just a constant. So that constant you could pull outside, and the integral of dx is just x. So it would be the square root of y2 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus x1 squared over x2 minus x1 squared times x. And you evaluate that from x1 to x2. 
So it's this thing that's just a constant, square root of y2 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus x1 squared over x2 minus x1 squared times x2 minus x1. Okay? Well, the square root of this thing here is x2 minus x1. That's under the square root. So this cancels that out. And what are you left with? The arc length s is equal to the integral from y2 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus x1 squared, which is the distance between the two points. Duh. Okay. That's the arc length is the distance between this distance between two points. The straight line distance is the distance between the two points. Okay. I'm sorry. It seemed like a lot of well, much ado about nothing. It's exactly the length between the two points. Because it's a straight line, that arc is a straight line. And the length between this point and that point is the distance between the two points. And that's all there is to it. I'm sorry, it sort of drove me nuts having to do it, but probably drove you more so. Uh, there is a blurb at the top of the page uh, since this one of my best classes ever, uh, of course, okay, and how many uh, research papers have I got in already? Uh, oh, zero, okay, so folks, here's another potential paper topic, good old Christian Huygens, now he is, a, this isn't what I knew him so much from, but he's a Dutch mathematician, good Dutch name, right, Christian Huygens, who also invented the pendulum clock, and James Gregory, a Scottish mathematician, uh, much younger, about nine years younger than Huygens, uh, and he died earlier too, both made early contributions to the problem of finding the length of a rectifiable curve. So there's two potential paper topics there. Christian Huygens, James Gregory, and how they went about doing it, compared, contrast, there's lots of potential paper topics you can get right there. Let's turn the page. All right, and let's do, oh, let's watch how they do it. I'm sure it's pretty exciting, okay? Because f prime of x is equal to m, and m is the slope, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, then you can do your S is equal to the integral from x1 to x2, that's your a to b, of the square root of 1 minus 1 plus your f prime squared, but that's your f prime, and we're going to square it. So it would be that thing squared. Okay? And then they rewrote it over. They wrote uh, 1 as x2 minus x1 over x2 minus x1 squared. Okay? Uh, so you got over the same thing. Uh, and when you do the integral of a constant, that's just a constant. You just get the x times the constant. And you evaluate that from x1 to x2. And that gives you x1, x2 minus x1 outside the integral. Inside the integral, this is the square root of x2 minus x1, which is you pull the square root up to here and make that just x2 minus x1. That cancels that out, and you're left with the distance between the two points. And that's the arc length, okay? Whether you recognize that as a distance, it took you so far around it that that's what you get. Which is the formula for the distance between two points in a plane? It's shown here. The formula for the arc length is the standard distance formula. Big surprise. Okay. Now, that's, that's the only one they do. None with any curves in it, just the one that we knew the answer already. So let's go back and do example two. And we'll do three. And we'll do four. And we'll do five. And then we'll come. Yes. 
Oh, okay. I thought you were saying it's time already, and it couldn't be, couldn't possibly be, right? Okay. How are we doing? For Twelve minutes. Yeah. Let's get example two done. Okay. Find the arc length of the graph of. Now I'll tell you these were some funny looking functions. Y is equal to x cubed over 6 plus 1 over 2x. One of my favorite functions of all time. Okay, on the interval from 1 half to 2. Okay, it's shown in the figure over here. Okay, now I'm not going to draw the figure too much. Um, it starts here, goes down like this, and winds up there. Okay? Probably got it a bit extended. This is x equal one half. Okay? When x is equal to one half, this is one eighth over six, which is one forty eighth plus one is one and whatever I just said that thing was. Yeah. But, okay, and then it goes to 2. Uh, 2, you have 8 over 6, which would be 4 over 3 plus 1 over 4. So 4 thirds plus 1 fourth some value up here. I've, I've got it too high. But anyway, that's the arc length we're wanting to do. This is value 2 here. That's the arc length we're looking for. What is the first thing you're going to have to do? Oh, question. Why didn't we go from minus 1 half to 2? Dawson probably should know this one because he pointed it out earlier. Why can't we go minus one half to two? Minus one half to two would be skipping over zero. What happens at zero? It goes undefined because you can't do one over two times zero. So you could not possibly do an arc length that went from one side of the uh, y-axis to the other side. You cannot, well, on this function, you cannot do that because you have a discontinuity at, t at x equals 0. So that's out of the question here. Okay? So, but we're perfectly fine here. There's no discontinuities between 1 half and 2. So what's one of the first things we're going to have to do? Take a derivative. Y prime is equal to Yeah, that's what yeah, derivative. X squared over two. Very good. Okay, everybody see that? Okay. Plus ooh. Before I take a derivative of that, I think I want to rewrite it as 1 half times x to the minus 1. Isn't that a little easier to take a derivative of? What would be its derivative? Anybody? Anybody? One half is the bottom of the Okay, wait just a second. Say that again. One half what? One is two x to the minus two. X to the minus two, is that what you said? Yes. Okay, I'll buy that. Let's write it in slightly different form. X squared. 
Let's do a 1 half times x squared minus x and minus 2. That's a pretty good form, right? Or you could have written this as 1 half x squared minus 1 over x squared. That works too, right? Okay. Now what do we got to do? Square it. Okay. So take that derivative. Take that derivative and square it. Okay. Now, I think this form is probably going to be a little easier to square. So let's do it. What will y prime squared be? 1 half squared is? 1 fourth. And that squared will be? x to the fourth. Minus, say again. I can't hear you. Is it going to be a plus because it's a negative point? Okay, so I hear a plus. X. X. Help me, somebody. Negative fourth. Okay, I've got that part okay, but I seem like I'm missing a cross term, am I not? If you're squaring a binomial, we squared this, and we also squared that. Don't I have a cross term in there? What's that? Uh, like a foiling. Remember, it's this one squared plus twice the product of the two plus that one squared. This is that squared and that squared. I'm missing twice the product of the two. That's going to be a minus two. But what is x squared times x to the minus two? In other words, x is not zero. Oh, yeah, x to the zero, which would be one. You're absolutely right. That's it right there. Now, I think I'll write it this way, 1 fourth x to the fourth minus 2 plus x to the minus 4, if that's okay. All right. Now, what's the next thing we do to it? Add 1 to it, okay? So, why don't we add 4 fourths to it? Sound okay? All right, now let's maybe distribute that across and see what we get. Second, yeah, you still got the one fourth x to the fourth, and this will be one fourth of times a minus 2 is a minus 1 half. So this will be a minus 1 half. And this will be a plus 1 fourth x to the minus 4. And rather than adding 4 fourths, let's add 2 halves. Isn't that still 1? And what does that give us? 1 fourth x to the fourth plus 1 half plus one-fourth x to the minus-fourth. And then what we want to do with that? Take a square root of it. Now, I want to point something out to you. This thing squared gave you a minus one-half that's here, right? This is something very similar, but with a plus one half in it, anyone want to make a guess of what its square root might be? 
just like this, except that's a zero plus. That's why we chose such a weird formula to begin with. We needed something that when you did take that square root, that gives you a perfect square. So now you can do your formula. So your S is equal to the integral from Where is it going from and to? Had we forgotten already? One half to two of this thing squared. That's, I mean, the square root of this thing. That's what we have. This happens to be exactly um, one half of x squared plus x to the minus two. We've gone all the way around to being that again, dx. Okay? Now, I'm going to pull that one half outside. Integral from one half to two. Now, what's the antiderivative? Let me skip a step here because I'm running out of room. Now let's just take the antiderivative of it. Okay. Tack the one half on the outside. What's the antiderivative of x squared? X cubed, x cubed over three plus antiderivative of that. Yes. Second. 1 over x, minus 1 over x, right? Okay. And evaluate that from 1 half to 2. That would be a 1 half. And what would that be? Ah, I missed my 1s and zeros. Don't you? 0 to 1. I miss it badly. Okay. So what will that first one be? x equal 2, what do we have? 8 thirds. Minus one half, then minus a pot. Anybody? What do you say? 1 24th. Okay, because it's 1 8th times 1 3rd is 1 24th. Then minus or minus will be a plus. What? 1 over 1 half. <laughs> Excuse me. I think we're out of time, aren't we? Isn't that a plus two? One over one half is two. Okay. So, just real quickly here, if I can do anything quickly, it would be a one half times, adding the positives together, we have, they're getting everything into 20, oh boy, I don't want to do that. That would be 2 and 2 thirds plus 2 would be 4 and 2 thirds. That would be 14 thirds. Is that right? I think that's right. Minus. 12 24ths minus 1 24th is minus 13 24th. And then the rest of it is just having to do least common denominators and stuff. Uh, let's just hold off here. And that comes out to be 33 16ths. And I haven't worked out the math on it, but that's what the answer is 33 16. You can work them out at home. You can uh, 
do that. I may have even botched up something here. The numbers aren't looking the same to me. Yeah, I had... No. I've messed up a number somewhere here. Oh, no, no, no. They multiply by one half. So I'm not going to fiddle with it. Uh, but that's what you get. We'll start next time with example three. We don't have any time. Sorry. Let me give you a few homework exercises here. Uh, do number five. It's a calc chat. And then try seven or nine. They're both a calc chat. Seven's a calc view. And you might try any of the other odds, 11 through 19. They should all be at calc chat. Okay. Uh, you can try doing 21 to 29 there at calc chat as well. But let's hold off <clears throat> maybe until we do a few more so you can get the hang of it. All right. Good deal. Sorry we ran out of time. These fractions take so long. But you see, they come up with weird, weird problems in order to get them so it's something you can integrate. Yes? How do you do one half to the negative two power? One half to the negative two power. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Was that somewhere on here? Yes. Oh. Well, it wasn't when you integrated, you got something. One half to the negative two power would be. Um, There's two. Yeah, that would be two. Huh? Sorry. Okay. One half to the negative two power. That should be the same as two to the second power. Because it's one half to the negative one. Square, right? So that'll be two squared. Two squared is four. Two four. He wrote down two. Uh, but did I have it to the negative two power or did I have it to the negative one power? Uh, because when we integrated, it went to one over x. Yeah, it went to one. It integrated it, it went over this one direct. So this it became is. became one over x. Right. Yeah. Right. One over x. All right, there probably are some errors in there. It's just too late to find them. I'm going to end this.